Hello, everybody. Welcome to this session of the Enable AI Conference. My name is Mike Gillen. I'm the CTO and co-founder of a company called BlockSec. Uh, we're a company that's here in the Durham region, and we specialize in passwordless security. Today, we're going to be talking about the role of AI in identity. So myself, I've been working in the identity and access management space for more than 20 years. And over the past, I would say five years, we've seen a real shift in the world of identity and the world of access control, the perimeter is going away. And what I mean by that is in the traditional organization where people would sit in an office and have a firewall and an internal network, there was this great perimeter around the, the entire network that would keep all of the assets safe, all of the company's intellectual property, all of the computers. But increasingly, as computing has moved out to the cloud, the so-called digital transformation, we've seen that that perimeter has been perforated. And then in the past two years, of course, with, with COVID-19 and people increasingly working from home, that perimeter has all but gone away. You're working in your own house, you're on your own Wi-Fi network, there's no more firewall that's protecting you. So we've, we've seen a shift in cybersecurity in the past few years to the point where we now say identity is the new perimeter. Identity is really the thing that determines what you can do uh, from a, a digital perspective. And as we'll talk about today, identity is also pervasive in the rest of the world, in your personal life, not just uh, you as, a, as an employee at an organization. Joining me today for this talk uh, is Caitlin Kapadia. Caitlin is the co-founder of BlockSec and uh, my brother from another mother. Uh, Caitlin, uh, welcome to this to the talk. Thank you, Mike. So Caitlin, <clears throat> I just touched on how the perimeter is gone and how today identity is more important than ever from a cybersecurity perspective and also I think Moving forward, as more of our lives become digitized, identity is just going to become more and more important. So let's let's maybe start off our conversation and just talk a little bit about how identity has become such an important part of our lives today. Oh, and 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 I think that's a great great conversation, right? So I think you know you know if, if you know so just going back to your earlier point of the perimeters are no longer there, right? So I think if we even if you go back about ten years ago. Um, we, we were in this world where we, we have we, we had the traditional data centers, we had traditional intranet applications and stuff like that. And typically any customer interaction that would happen with the organization, we would have these DMZ zones where you know we would host our external <clears throat> websites and things. Um, obviously with the uh, you know with the adoption of cloud digital transformation services, and as we see, uh, more of the software as a service type platforms enabling um, the, the the businesses, especially on the digital transformation process, um, identity sort of becoming the key perimeter, right? And and you know so you know traditionally, I would have my login to work, I would VPN in into a platform or a system. However, today, as an organization, um, you know that perimeter or factor no longer exists, right? So for example, as a Salesforce, I could be a user of the Salesforce from an external perspective, but at the same time, I could be logging into Salesforce through my organization to do administrative type of work. So ultimately, you know, at the end of the day, the same platform is serving my customers, the same platform is serving me as the user of the platform from an organization perspective. So ultimately now what's happening is, is that <clears throat> all of our users are coming into that same flow. So how do you ensure that, you know, this is indeed Katen and, and, and what persona Katen has when he's coming into this application? So obviously the importance of identity is, is becoming very critical. And then sort of tying back to that, how do you ensure that, you know, Katen has the right persona, but more importantly, as we look at looking things from an access control perspective, how do we ensure those things are defined appropriately? And then obviously, as, as you know, as we talk about AI in general, um, and I think this is where I kind of see where elements of AI can really help drive those key elements on identifying who you are, where you are, where are you coming from to really help drive those things at a high level? 
Absolutely, yeah. I, I want to definitely tie identity back to AI. It's almost like this topic can almost go both ways, right? Is what is the role of AI in identity? Exactly. And what is the role of identity in AI? We can, we can look at it from, it's sort of two sides of the same coin. Um, so I, maybe let's talk about uh, user behavioral analytics. Uh, that's one place I know, you know we talk about where identity uh, and AI have really come together and where they really worked well together is in, is in this field. So user behavioral analytics is sort of the, the practice of observing and collecting information about a person's typical patterns. So as, as you all know, the many people are watching today who are going to be more versed and more expert in AI than certainly than myself, but uh, one of the main branches of AI is machine learning and being able to collect vast amounts of data, being able to look at that data and establish patterns. Uh, certainly when it, when it comes to logging into a website, when I'm logging into a website or an application, there are certain characteristics about that whole transaction, the location it comes from, the IP address, the computer and the browser that I use on, on a regular basis, uh, a number of different factors, the times of day that I access. So if we, if we collect all of this information about every person and every transaction that they have with that website, we're able to build up quite a big lake of data, right? So how do we, what do we do with that? No, and, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of an interesting point. I think even before we sort of go back into the telemetry of all this information, I think the, the, the other aspect, you know, so I think if you look at sort of things from a user behavior analytics perspective, so, you know, this sort of term and, you know, capabilities have been around for the last eight to 10 years, right? And we've seen a lot of vendors out there sort of talking about, hey, we, we do user behavior analytics. And, and I think if you look at the traditional way of doing things, a lot of these things have sort of taken the rudimentary approach of, well, let's look at where you're coming from. Let's look at what IP address do you come from. And, you know, we will set cookies and stuff like that from a browser perspective, right? And, you know, you know, I, I remember um, even about five years ago, I obviously use RBC from a banking perspective. And, and when I used to travel, typically, it, you know, it will kind of say, oh, you, you are no longer coming from a known IP. You're not in a normal location. So I'm now going to prompt you for, you know, give me your mother's maiden name and all that type of information. So I think, you know, we had those sort of rules and capabilities, but with AI, you know, these things are sort of changing now where, you know, yes, we, we are still looking at some of those rudimentary information around where you're coming from, where are you based, what, what sort of your behavior is, is this sort of your normal pattern? But in addition to that, what, what, what we see with some of the new user behavior analytic type solutions and tools out there is it's also going one step further in, in, in regards to, um, you know, if you're using a mobile device, then, you know, there's things that can be done at a mobile device perspective as you have you typing or have you doing certain things to sort of tie back to that level from a minutia level perspective to really sort of tie back to you from a user perspective. But, but then there's also sort of the intelligence gathering that happens behind the scenes in, in the aspect of, you know, how are, you know, are you using that same email address? Are, are some of the elements <clears throat> associated to you, patterns, capabilities? And I think this is where capabilities like AI are really help providing that enrichment of data, but, but also with the AI capabilities, what's also happening is, is that as every time you come in as a, as a user, I can start establishing some risk criteria associated to you as a user, and, and I can assign you some level of risk number and then based on that risk association every time you come in I, I can kind of you know provide that risk aspect and say well you know that the behavior looks risky today how do I want to handle it right so I think so I think these are some of the things that you know we are starting to see from an industry perspective where we are seeing that shifting change of not only using my AI, you know, like my IP and rudimentary information, but also help driving this additional things, which can be easily achieved with the power of AI. That's a great point. 
And actually in, in researching this topic for, for our chat today, I learned, I learned something interesting in terms of sort of what's coming next and sort of the research that's happening in, in academia. Uh, in places like the AI Hub at Durham College, uh, academics are, are researching other techniques that they can use to be more precise and to be more sure about who people are uh, and that actors on websites are in fact who they say they are and that it's not a fraudulent actor because as you know that's a massive massive market uh, i think last year it was it was to the tune of 27 billion dollars uh, right. this market of online fraud detection and so so what they're doing the research that they're focusing on right now is taking it up even a higher layer in that osi model going up to the application layer and so what, what we, you and I just talked about, a lot of that is the network layer. How are you getting in? Exactly. What device are you using? All of that kind of stuff. These guys are taking it even further. They're looking at actually real-time application logs where, you know, if you're on a website and you're clicking on links, every time you click, that's making a request to the web server. And the web server is logging that. And so they can they're actually analyzing what are the patterns of usage what are the links that are clicked what is that flow through the website that a natural e-commerce user might might use and then they're they're teaching again it's machine learning right so they're they're teaching the algorithms feeding them in malicious traffic and they're saying here's here's a malicious actor and here's what the malicious actor did yeah. and so the algorithms are actually learning to pick up and identify and be able to pick out those malicious traffic patterns. And so now using that knowledge, they can start to build in real time, like traffic guards, right? So they right. can say, okay, no, this does not look like natural e-commerce traffic. We're gonna put a stop to this. We're gonna have somebody come and take a look at this. And so we're moving from, you know, like you said at the beginning, it was it used to be kind of rudimentary where it was really IP based and you'd say, okay, well, we know we don't really have customers overseas, so we're going to limit it to North America. That was very rudimentary, just rule-based. With the power of AI, now we're getting to this really granular, really powerful way of protecting these online sites. Yeah, no, and, and, and I agree, right? And I think, you know, so obviously I know we, we've talked a little bit about sort of the consumer facing side of the things or you know <clears throat> online fraud detection kind of the normal behavior and obviously that behavior not necessarily only applies from a consumer side of the things but also when we look at you know things from an enterprise side of things too i remember back in 2007 when i joined a a startup focusing on sort of identity and access governance um, you know, we had introduced this concept of role mining and 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 role modeling, right? And 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 really, back in those days, you know, we 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 leverage an algorithm, sort of the nearest neighbor al algorithm, and you know, the system would behind the scenes go and kind of say, hey, you know, using this algorithm, point a, you know, point a two two plane axis and draw the entitlements and then give us the list of common things across right so uh, you know I, I kind of go back and look at that from you know you know almost 13 14 years ago with, with some of the changes from that to today as to where we're seeing this enhancements from an AI perspective right so you know if you look at some of the traditional vendors in this space they're putting in a lot of effort and capabilities already exist today where you know ai ml is sort of built into these platforms where i no longer have to go and sort of execute this what i would say a manual process of role mining and role modeling process but you know as well, hold, hold, hold on hold on let, let me stop you yeah, yeah because yeah. because we're we're here with an audience who are you know, maybe are not so familiar with what, yeah, yeah, what no, the heck right. are yeah. we talking about? We're not, we're not <laughs> digging in the dirt. Yeah. Tell, tell me what, what do you mean by role mining and role modeling? Like first let's explain that because it's yeah. important to understand so, how painstaking and what a huge yeah. amount of data that is. So, you know, so, 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 so typically when we look at things from an enterprise perspective, right? So, um, you know, let's just say if, if, if there's a clerk who 
let's say there's an administration clerk who starts at Durham College or needs to be onboarded, typically what we want to do is that when this individual gets onboarded, we, we kind of want to say, okay, well, if you're an administration clerk, then you should get certain type of access to effectively do your job. So in this way, when, when this person comes on board, we will give them a functional role of administration clerk. And with that, they will get certain type of access across various systems within Durham College. Um, so traditionally, when we did this kind of things, you know, you, you know, I, I remember going back to the days, now I'm gonna give my age away, where, you know, we actually did some of this thing in Excel files. We would sort of take all this data elements, run some macros, write some macros to sort of give us that data. And obviously over the years, technology has helped simplify this process. So, so going back to the, this concept of functional roles or roles, um, you know, a lot of that work was sort of done manually where, where you, you know, so part of these identity and access management platforms, you, you're sort of consuming information from various systems that, that kind of tells you who has access to what. And once we sort of get that information, then we will sort of, you know, do what we call it is role mining, role modeling to, to kind of say, okay, well, now from all this access we have, give us things that are sort of common across certain type of people. So in this way, now we can kind of create those compartments or functional roles that says that, hey, if you are an administration administrative clerk, then you're going to need access to these five systems and across those five systems, potentially access to, let's say, about 22 uh, specific permissions to allow you to sort of do your job. And, and the goal is that when this person joins tomorrow, they are given access to this role, which inherently will give them the permissions they need um, to basically do their day-to-day -day job and, and function. Um, so, so, and so, so I'm, and so to answer Richard's question in the chat about right. can AI be used to limit the mistakes or to, to minimize mistakes? Absolutely. That's yes. exactly, that's exactly what Caitlin's talking about here is by actually, I'm going to, I'm going to answer your question in a roundabout way. I'm going to say <laughs> yes, with an asterisk, I would say that having these roles that Caitlin is talking about are go a long way to minimizing mistakes and to becoming more efficient when it comes to provisioning access. With the big that asterisk, there's a big caveat, and that is that in my in my past experience, having these roles is a bit of a how do I say this politely dumpster fire. It it's, is. It's a disaster, and that's where AI comes in. So I'll tell you the story of uh, a project that I did at one of Ontario's large utilities. There's only two, so you get a fifty percent chance of getting it right. And they had, I'm going to say it was 18,000 employees. And across those 18,000 employees, uh, they needed to map out roles because access was, let's say, like, uh, yeah, that term, I can't use that term. <laughs> it was terrible. It was, it was a big mess. It needed to be cleaned up. And they wanted to enable efficient provisioning to exactly for that reason. They wanted to eliminate mistakes because Provisioning mistakes when it comes to, you know, the clerk example that Caton gave is not such a big deal. But when it's a provisioning mistake that allows somebody access to a nuclear facility, that's now getting really serious. Um, so with 18,000 people, they had more than 100 applications. Each application had dozens of entitlements. You're talking about a huge amount of information. Uh, so the company I was working with at the time, a local company, built a product that we called, we, we built from scratch because nothing existed at the time that could do this. It was called Profile Entitlements Rule Map Manager, P-E-R-M, we called it PERM. And the name PERM was quite ironic because it was anything but permanent. Because what we did is we, we went in, we took this tool, interviewed people, HR managers, looked at org structures, modeled out the organization, using again we're using technology to try to make our jobs easier and we built out a set of about a thousand profiles so these profiles are what we call the roles the functional roles that Caitlin's talking about it was we thought it was a great success the utility was very happy with what we delivered everything was great we circled back with them about a year later and asked them about how things were going with perm and the people we spoke to said what what's that we've never heard of that 
<laughs> it turned out it turned out that within about a month of deploying the the entitlements the roles and all of the functions became out of date and stale so much so that to the point that they they actually just threw it away it was it was producing roles for people that were no longer correct and the the manual burden of having to administer the system was so great they would have needed multiple full-time people to administer it and it was just untenable so it was mothball so that's an example of pre-ai technology trying to do this job where really we need we need some smarts we need we need a computer with an algorithm that's able to learn and build out proper roles to be able to manage the volume of data and the volume of change in data that happens at a large organization like that. Yeah, and and obviously to 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 add on to that too, right? Like again, I think you know a, a lot of manual work used to happen in those days, and as you mentioned, like often with you know changes in business, changes in the way business do things as new applications come on board, you have to go back and refactor those those things manually, right? So I think with the introduction of AI and ML in this world, things become way easier, right? And and, mm -hmm. and what I really mean by that is that, you know, a lot of the new solutions or platforms, you know, they, they, again, yes, I can go in, you know, in, in defining those functional roles, I have to don't, I don't have to go and manually do those things, right? With, with, you know, with some of those capabilities and functionality, it, it, it kind of comes back and says, hey, based on certain criteria that you've provided to me, I am kind of proposing these are some other functional roles you can create. And, and these are the common type of people that go in these roles. These are the common type of permissions that, that, that sort of go in those roles. So now it's giving you that predictive uh, information where you now as either system administrator or even from a business perspective, it becomes very easy for you to go and kind of look at the things that it's providing and say, okay, well, you know not now I just have to spend maybe 15, 20 minutes to look at some of these things in details, clean up the things that I don't need. And then I can effectively now go and promote that functional role to, 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 to make it production ready. Right. So what would take weeks in the past from manual work to validating all this stuff for the business and stuff like that now, with AI ML and all the analytics coming out of it really makes it easy for us to go and look at these things. But more importantly, as new systems get added, as things get changed, the beauty with AI and ML in sort of the identity now, what, 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 what becomes much nicer now is that as things change, you know, these systems will let me know in real time that, hey, your, your, your quality of the role which was, you know, let's say 100% has now dropped down to 80% because of X, Y, and Z, right? So, so, so I think this is where, um, you know, it, it really enhances things from a business perspective. And I, think, and I think these things are also important because, you know, ultimately today, if you look at cyber breaches, ransomware and all those things, a lot of these things sort of start back with, you know, a lot of permissive access given to users. So really the goal over here is that how can we enable that list privilege model and by keeping these things up to date, by, by keeping these things, you know, having AI ML give these, you know, valuations and scoring criteria really allows the businesses to ensure that they are staying on top of things from a business perspective, but more importantly, also helping the organization, you know, achieve that security that they're looking for overall. And I can tell you that certainly the identity vendors are working very hard. They're putting a lot of money into enabling these types of capabilities, leveraging AI, leveraging ML. So if you're studying those topics right now, good news for you, these identity vendors are going to pay big bucks to get your skills to be able to enhance their products. Uh, for example, uh, you may have heard the name SailPoint. SailPoint is a, a very large uh, identity, what would, what, are they, what would you call them, Kaden? Risk and compliance? They're, yeah, yeah, they're an identity and access governance platform. Governance platform, yeah, there yep. you go. So they, they're sort of their bread and butter is aggregating that information, that access information for many systems, and then getting managers to review to see if it's appropriate or not. Uh, they've they've 
created a whole separate module for their platform called Identity AI. And the whole purpose of that is to look at those bits of access, look at those aggregates of access, and try to pick out patterns of inconsistent access so that so that they can highlight those to managers and managers can scrutinize those a little more carefully. Yeah. Um, taking it, if, if I can go back to that story uh, at the, the Ontario utility, the company I was working for, uh, if it's okay for me to shout them out, they're called N8 Identity. They're a local company here in Burlington. Uh, and they took the learnings from that actually and built a product called the Access Hub. And what the Access Hub does is it they they brought in an AI expert, a very smart computer scientist by the name of Walter Berndl, who built a module for them that would do that exact type of modeling, looking at the access. Uh, and they went further than just building roles, like suggesting roles, but they actually would real time suggest to people doing provisioning. So somebody gets onboarded to the company. They're flowing through this workflow where they're getting all their access. This engine would say, based on these attributes that we've collected, these HR attributes, your job title, your job role, your salary band, where you work, what office you're in, things like that, would say people who have similar traits have this access. These are, these are suggested entitlements. Do you want to add this to the person? And, and it would do so in real time. And so I would I would argue actually as we as we look to the future in this technology, I think probably those days of building out these big roles is going to die, yeah. and we're gonna we're gonna get to because as somebody great once said, I wish I'd written down who the quote is from. Great technology makes simple things simple, and impossible things possible. So we're gonna get to the point where we no longer need to build these baskets of entitlements, but rather we can customize the access that somebody needs in a company based on those attributes about them without having to say copy it from somebody else which is a bad practice and without having to guess and make mistakes so coming full circle to Richard's question that AI is going to enable us to do efficient provisioning for users with less error and much more efficiency yeah. So I think we have another question twice. over here around how useful is analytics and managing an IAM rollout. I, you know, so, so, so I'll I'll kind of take the first stab at it. I think any information that we can get from an analytics perspective upfront, I think really makes the rollout, you know, much easier, right? So I'll just go from a traditional way of looking at things, right? So when we look at kicking off any sort of IAM initiative at, at an organization, some of the common questions we're going to ask and say, well, do you know how many users you have? Do you know an understanding? Do you have an understanding of average entitlements per user? How many help desk tickets do you get, right? So, so this is a lot of analytical information that helps us drive certain things from a business requirements, requirements gathering and, and so forth, right? So I think, um, you know, having the analytical information does definitely help drive sort of streamline your IAM rollout, but more importantly, it also helps the alignment of enabling the right business processes within that solution, right? So typically, you know, when we sort of look at any traditional identity and access governance projects, right? Most of them are going to focus towards what we call as a user life cycle process. And when we say user life cycle process, it's basically saying that going back to my example of that administrative clerk that we're going to onboard at, at, at Durham College, right? So he or she are, are going to start tomorrow. That's their day one. So, you know, part of the user onboarding process, they are going to get certain things and capabilities to do their job day one. But then as they stay with the organization, they may maybe change their roles. They, they may move up the ladder. So as they as they move or change roles within the organization, their access has to change with them, right? So there's a there's now what we call the sort of the change process associated to the user from permissions perspective. And if and when this individual leaves the organization, then how are we effectively handling that termination process from a user perspective, right? So that's the entire life cycle of a user. So really, 
you know, when we look at any typical IAM rollout, these are some of the things we are looking for. So any any information sort of ties back, not you know, from an analytics perspective that the organization can provide, but also, you know, from a process perspective, it could really help streamline the processes across the board when we look at enabling any sort of an IAM platform. I would agree with that. And I would I would add to that probably doing analytics on the input data to the IAM system is would be very helpful. Uh, I've been I've been with many projects where the data that we get in terms of who are the who are the employees or who are the people in the organization is not really the best. And what I mean by that is you've got titles that mean the same thing but that are spelled differently because somebody's keying these titles in on a keyboard you've got missing data you've got dates that are the wrong format and so if you're, if you're then trying to process that stuff automatically you run into problems you get you know two roles for what should be one role you get people whose start dates are missing you're not able to calculate people whose end dates are not populated but they don't work there anymore so if you could do some analytics on the front end before before trying to bring that information into the IAM tool, because those IAM tools are not, I'll be honest, they're, they're sometimes not the smartest, right? It's garbage in, garbage out. So doing some analytics, and certainly I think, you know, if, if you're looking for an idea to, to build something of use to the industry, uh, that's probably a good place to do some research and do some work to uh, bring some value to one of the common implementation problems for IAM projects today. Yep. <clears throat> and, you know, so I think the, you know, I think the the other area that, you know, so I think we, we talk a lot about identity, but then I think there's an aspect of it of, you know, typically many organizations look at it from a governance risk and compliance, which is um, typically referred to as GRC, right, which typically helps an organization align its information technology with business objectives while managing risk in and meeting the regulatory uh, requirements. And typically when you've given that definition a few times, it sounded, (laughs) Um, sounded like you were reading from Wikipedia. Um, well, I've, 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 I've had many conversations in the past and in, in, in regards to this, right? But, but so, 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 so typically what we see over here, right, is that, you know, many organizations, like they have to meet their GRC requirements. And, and often when, when GRC time projects are initiated, often it requires a lot of human intervention, manual processes, you know, assigning risks to the application, assigning owners to the application, and kind of putting things in perspective from a business landscape too. And and, and often these projects can take years by the time they even get a lot of that information together, right? So Mm -hmm. if, 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 you know, if you look at AI from a GRC perspective, right, the the, the value that AI brings to this type of capabilities is to really ability to automate some of these tasks and capabilities, which can reduce a lot of effort in human hours, right? Because by, by, by again, going back to taking AI ML from various, you know, from, from various sources of data, allowing you to do what it needs to do from an analytics perspective, it can really reduce that effort of hours that a typical human would, would, would sort of put to sort of handle that, right? And then obviously sort of in ensuring that, you know, when, when you're looking at things from a framework perspective, from a GRC perspective, whether it's meeting sort of the IT regulatory requirements or some, sometimes and often also the legal and, and audit requirements, um, you know, AI, uh, you know, AI ML can play a, a big role in help streamlining those processes and, you know, with the computation power, with, with, with the definition of all those things, it really helps create a, a simple way to present that information. Again, reducing the overall effort. And, and more importantly, AI is also give you, going to give you that holistic view across all the different telemetry of data, which today it, it's a, it requires a lot of manual work from where your sources of data, right? So, so ultimately by, by, by leveraging a combination of AI data lakes and that combination, you can really simplify and, you know, simplify that process to really meet your, 
GRC compliance needs? Good question from Jake is, uh, which ties back to that, that topic you just talked about is can, can AI lead you astray? Using AI, can, can it cause your IAM implementation to go wrong? So I always put it this way, there's a two sides to the coin, right? <laughs> so so the, the, the answer is, it, it, it really depends back on the type of data and the information you feed, right? Like I think as, 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 as Mike mentioned, right? It's, you know, garbage in, garbage out. If you're gonna feed bad data into, you know, sort of your AI platform and, and based on the analysis that it, it does, um, obviously, yes, the, the output is gonna be garbage and you can have a very, you know, wrong deployment, or at least not the information that you will, you, you will be looking from an IAM program. So, right. So again, going back to the comment that might make earlier that having that analytical information, if you can run that analytics on the data prior to ingesting that into sort of the platform, then really that would help simplify that process. Yeah. I think, I think the, the speed and power that AI brings uh, can it, like it's, it, improves automation right it should improve accuracy but if you're if you're operating with the wrong process if you're operating with the wrong algorithm what you've just done is really accelerated doing the wrong thing so i think as long as, long as you've got that good foundation and you have proper oversight of your iam implementation and, and all of its flows ai is going to help you yeah that's my feeling anyway and then, yeah, I agree. And then obviously, you know, when we sort of look at identity in, in general, right? And, and I know in, in the world we live today, especially with the digital transformation that, that we are going through, you know, we now have upwards of 100 plus accounts. Every system that we interacted, we, we have our own username, password, and, and so forth. And then ultimately, a lot of these systems are also now relying on you know, sort of that identity verification process. Is this really in the Katen who's logging in? Is this really the Mike who's who's logging in? Right. So we're we're also seeing kind of a big, I wouldn't necessarily say sort of a big shift, but we're also seeing the the use of AI ML type technologies instead of helping drive that identity verification process. Right. So again, there there are a lot of vendors today that exist that will, you know, sort of say, hey, scan your driver's license or scan your passport, look into the camera, right? We will, we will take a couple of live pictures of you and sort of do that real time verification of data. Right. And again, um, you know, so, you know, within the identity context of, you know, for, for, for Mike and I, we look at those things as what well, well, I call this a self-attestation where I'm taking pictures or I'm uploading my documents to sort of provide some level of self-attestation that, yes, there is some accuracy about this picture. But again, you know, if, if we look at without technologies like artificial intelligence and sort of machine learning behind it, a lot of these things of self-attestation would have not been possible today, right? Because traditionally, even 10 years ago, um, you know, if, if I were to, you know, walk into a, a club in my younger years, I had to flash out my driver's license and the bouncer would look at it and look at me, right? But now with the way some of these technologies exist, you know, with some of this pre-computation already done, I can just kind of show show them a QR code that they can scan. And, and ultimately it, it gives them the irrelevant information for them to say, hey, this is sort of good enough, right? Like I don't have to share a whole lot of personally identifiable in, in, in information as, as, as part of that. So I think we're also gonna see sort of more advancements in this area as we grow. And I think, you know, tied, tied that, tied back to that is sort of the privacy aspect, right? Yeah, and, so um, I wanted to go there. I'm glad you, I'm glad yeah. you segued into that. And, and 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 I think I think there's a privacy element to all of these things too, right? And and I think, you know, and I think, and I think, you know, everything has its goods and bads, right? So um, for AI ML engines, 
you need all this data, but, but, but then how much data is too much? And then how much is it that you know about me where, where it's too much? <laughs> and, and what are you doing with that data? Right. So I know at the Women in Cyber event that just happened, uh, there was a whole panel discussion about the creepiness factor. Right. And how sometimes if you get too much data, if you don't, if you don't steward, I don't know if steward is, if I can use it that way, if you don't steward it properly, is that a verb? Uh, if you don't have proper stewardship over that data and how you use it, right. it can get creepy really fast. Um, I can tell a, a great story uh, that I read in the New York Times a couple of years ago uh, related to Target. Uh, so we don't have Target in Canada anymore, but uh, Target became very successful actually by uh, targeting, pardon the pun, targeting marketing at customers. Yep. Um, and so there's there's this story of a, a gentleman who joined Target all the way back in 2012. And Target uh, was collecting a lot of information in terms of buying habits about their customers, and sometimes even without their knowledge. Right. They could tie your credit card number to your address that they got from other sources. Uh, they would they would look at the things that you were buying in store and they just they just started to collect all of this information. Uh, and so this gentleman uh, started to apply AI and ML techniques to this vast lake of data that Target had gathered. Um, and somebody stopped by his desk, the story goes, somebody stopped by his desk one day and said, uh, I think his name was Paul, hey Paul, can can with all this magic data that you have, can you tell uh, when a woman is going to give birth? Can you tell if somebody's pregnant and, and when they would give birth? And he thought about it and he, he said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see what I can find. Right. And so, so he said about looking at all of this data and, and working backwards, of course, from, from women that they, they knew did have babies. Uh, and he, was, he actually was able to establish a pattern. Uh, and so very interestingly, they found that uh, when women reached their second trimester, and they could, they could actually predict this with relative accuracy, uh, she would switch to buying uh, larger amounts of unscented creams and cotton balls and a number of other things. Uh, but they, they put all this together and they said, okay, let's, we know that when people reach certain milestones in their life, so getting married, buying a house, having a child, you establish sort of an imprint of patterns. And if we can, if we can get established with that person at that time when they imprint those patterns as a good place to shop, we'll have them as a loyal customer for many years. So let's really focus on those people. Let's, let's target those women who are coming, you know, between the second and third trimester, they're getting close to having a baby. Let's send them some, some really good coupons for maternity things that, that we can bring them into the store just, just when they give birth or just before. Uh, so they did this and uh, it wasn't long before a man stormed into the store holding a flyer in his hand. He demanded to see the manager and he, he, he got to the manager, what's the meaning of this? My daughter's is only in high school and here you're sending her, a, you know, flyers for baby things, diapers and cribs and what's going on? And the, the manager looked at it and of course it was indeed addressed to this person's right. daughter, yep. you know, home address. You know, I'm so sorry, you know, he's apologizing to the customer. I don't know how this could have happened. It must have been some type of mistake. Apologized profusely. The manager left, the, the customer eventually left the store. Uh, the manager followed up with them a few days later, uh, just called them to say, you know, again, I'm just really wanted to say I'm sorry for this, this mistake, this mishap. And the man on the phone uh, had changed his tone and said, uh, actually, I'm the one who needs to apologize. I, I had a discussion with my teenage daughter and it turns out she is in fact pregnant. Right. And so, so Target knew from her spending habits and was able to tell even before her father that she was pregnant. So. So this is this is an example. It's it's a little bit extreme, but it's I find it to be a very interesting example of how much our this is, and I know this is kind of loosely related to identity as we talked about earlier. But really, nothing could be more personal and identity about me right. than the things going on in my life. And yep. if AI and, AI and ML can be used to deduce things about me that are private to me. That's getting into the. That's definitely getting onto the creepy side right. of the meter, right. and I think I think we need to have very good long discussions about how we use that for good and not evil. Yeah, it, it's yeah. I agree with you. I think there's a lot of privacy implications around that, right? And and I think really, and I obviously 
we have seen that issue with Facebook, right? And the scandal they had where, you know, oh, Cambridge Analytica. Exactly. Right. So, you know, and, and obviously that's just one thing that has bubbled up, right? But I'm sure a lot of these things happen today where our, you know, data is the gold mine now, right? And 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 our data, our personal data, especially the browsing we do, anything we do is a digital footprint of everything you do. And, and this digital <clears throat> footprint is now taken and sold by organizations like Cambridge Analytics and so many companies like that exist out there who, who are selling our data, right? So which we don't even have a good understanding of, right? So I think, you know, I think we have talked about sort of the good side of how AI ML can really help drive things from an identity perspective, have help simplify things. But I think there's the other end of it where all this data can be used against us, right? And you know, this this classic example where, you know, obviously they were able to provide that level of prediction analytics and and, and do that uh, targeting again, that's great. But then again, incidentally, they they still do it. No, oh, yeah. They just, yeah. they just, what they just, they, they figured out that it creeps people out too much. So now what they do is they'll still send all those coupons, but they'll add a bunch of random stuff like lawnmowers yeah. and, you know, yeah. toolboxes and things. So, so now yeah. it looks, it looks random yeah. people and, and they found yeah. that people, people don't get mad yeah. if they don't think that they're being specifically targeted exactly. and, and they'll still use those coupons. So they've, yeah. they've learned from those mistakes. But but I think, you know, so so going back to sort of that, you know, privacy element is going to be key, right? So so really the, the question now boils down to is that, you know, as we're taking in all this data, as we running different kind of algorithms to kind of crunch all this data, how are we using that information, right? Like, mm -hmm. are we anonymizing the data or, or, you know, and I think that's going to be sort of, you know, that's sort of the non-technology aspect of things that we as people, you know, dealing with AI, working with AI, I think we need to put some of these things in perspective and say, okay, well, how far is too much? It's it's great. Like, you know, it like to me. How can we use it for good? Yeah. How can we use yeah, AI well, this is it, right? to, like, to yeah. improve privacy? Right, right. Like, you know, I, 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 you know, like a classic example, like, you know, in the medical field, right? take all the data from analysis perspective, but, you know, don't use what type of individuals they are. If, if you can remove those elements of personalization and just kind of look at it across the board and say, okay, this is sort of what we're seeing from a patterns perspective, then it's for good. But, but I think this is where, um, you know, this is where things are going to get interesting, where how, how this is coming to play, right? And I think if we look at sort of you know, the malicious actors and the hackers, right? They have the same type of all this data available to them too from an AI perspective. They they can run the same kind of things behind the scenes. And obviously for them, their key goal is to, how can I further infiltrate into an organization? How can I take this data and take mm -hmm. it to my advantage, mm -hmm. right? So, so now it also opens up that fundamental issue as to, who is getting this data? How is this data used against me or against that organization, which is impacting me as an individual, but also impacting the intellectual property of that organization at, at, at the same That's time if they're in play, right? So I think, uh, so I think yeah. So, so I think there are some elements to AI. And, and I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to say that we have solved every issue from an AI perspective, but I think as we look at growing AI, AI more and more and more, I think we also need to look at that side from a privacy perspective. And I think we need to start looking at things more closely now. And as we look at, you know, all these privacy acts coming in place and, you know, obviously you know, GDPR, CCP in California. And I think we're, we're going to see more and more of these come across. We need to ensure that as, and especially as us as individuals who may be driving some of these AI things, people on this, you know, on the session who are students who are learning AI or are, you know, in the process of maybe from a career perspective, when they go into AI, I think these are the things you need to look at and say, okay, well, how am I using this for the better good? And then how can I build models? How can I build these predictions where I am now not stereotyping certain elements from an individual perspective? If I can give a concrete example of where AI is being used for for that good, for the for the sake of privacy, uh, I think everybody 
and their mother is tired of visiting a website and getting a pop-up that says, do you accept these cookies? You know, if I, I know I've, I've actually navigated away from websites that it's like, no, I don't want your cookies. And if it's too hard for me to customize it, I'm like, forget it. I don't need to read that article. Exactly. Cookies are dead. And so companies are looking for, okay, how can we continue to, to provide the valuable targeted advertising uh, without the use of cookies? Because that's, that's a lot of the reason cookies are there today is to track you as you move between websites to pick up, okay, you visited Toys R Us, then you visited Home Depot and you looked at vacuum cleaners. And so later on you're, you're getting ads for diapers and you're getting ads for vacuum cleaners and you're like, what the heck's going on? <laughs> it's cookies. So those, those are going to die. Um, there have been enough laws passed that say you can't track people with cookies. Uh, Google's phasing it out this year. I think Firefox is as well. Um, so Google's actually doing some really good work on how they can leverage AI and ML to continue to provide value to their advertising customers, but also protect the privacy of their users. And so if you look at how ads are, are decided or chosen to be displayed on a site, uh, there's usually three things that go into that decision. They look at uh, contextual information. So, you know, this is the person is on a forum and it's a forum about motorcycles. So we're going to put up ads for motorcycle companies, for example. Then there's the sort of general information about the person, your interests. So if they know that you're interested in motorcycles, but you're on a different website, if they've got that information about you, they'll, again, they'll show those motorcycle ads. And then the third type is where you've actually been to a motorcycle website, you looked at a specific model, maybe you even started to customize it, and then you, you left. And so that's that's sort of that after the fact they, you might get that, hey, you left this in your cart, we can offer you 10% off if you come back and buy it kind of thing. So it's that second, that second one where they know your habits that they're focusing on in terms of being able to provide that value, because that's where Google makes most of its money from ads. And without cookies, they need a way to do that. So what, they've, what they're doing, they're, they're working on something that they've called the Federated Learning of Cohorts. Or FLOC. I'm not sure if they're pronouncing it flock or not, but I believe I believe they are because all the sub technologies are names of birds. So, so they've got their flock, uh, and the way it works is the browser itself, Chrome, your Chrome browser is going to be watching the types of things that you do, and it's going to be using machine learning to group you into a cohort. And these cohorts are large groups of people. We're talking thousands of people. Yeah. And that, co that cohort are people that share similar interests. And the cohort itself will be given a code, just a very short code like 4A37, for example. And so when you go to a website, your browser will tell that website, this person's part of cohort 4A37. And so the idea there is that there's, there's sort of privacy of being lost in the crowd because they don't know who you are specifically. They don't have any information specifically about you but they know that you're part of this cohort that likes motorcycles. And so then they can start advertising to you about motorcycles without revealing any private information or your browsing history. All of those signals that go into determining your cohort remain in the browser. So I guess that's a good example of how AI and ML can be used. You know, I, Google grew up with this kind of, we're, we're here for good, not evil. Recently, I've, my opinion has been a little bit swayed in the opposite direction, but here's, here's a, an example of how they're getting back to those roots. And I think this is a good improvement for browsing for everybody in terms of privacy. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And I, and, I think, and I think we're going to see more and more of this, right? And, you know, you, if you look at organizations like Apple, especially when they introduced a couple of years ago around the whole, you know, the, 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 the privacy aspect of things and the ability to, even when you log in and you can say, hey, use a fake email address than my real email address and stuff like that, right? So I think privacy is sort of becoming that key aspect. And, and, and I think... Um, you know, us as individuals, um, I, I think we are, are becoming more and more kind of, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say cautious is the word, but I think we're, we're also being very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? We're, we're, we're also trying to be very 
unique in the sense that I don't want to keep on handing over that same data to 20 people, right? Like I, I, I want to manage my data. I want to own my data. And then if I feel comfortable, I'm going to share that with you. And I think, and I think this is where, you know, when we kind of look at AI ML sort of down the road, um, it's, 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 it's going to be interesting to see how things sway and obviously things like this that organizations like google apple and them you know i think privacy is sort of at the forefront of things and i think we are going to see more and more organizations focusing towards this and obviously you know what's interesting is that we're also venturing into a web 3.0 world which which also now changes the dynamics completely right because we we now are humans but now we have this avatar in this digital world so what does that mean right so i think how is ai ml going to come into play and you know we're we're, we're already seeing challenges in sort of that world where people are complaining about you know privacy issues where we're already here we're already hearing things about you know inappropriate behavior and all that kind of stuff right so i think um so What's interesting is going to be to see is that we already have some of these challenges today in our physical world, but now we're creating this virtual world and we're going to create these same problems there. So I think we, we, we almost, we, we kind of need to take kind of a step to say, well, how can we control things from an AI ML perspective, put some guidelines and foundations in place, and then really sort of take that and also enable that into the web 3.0 world. So. And when we talk about identity, I mean, it, this this is now getting beyond my area of expertise, so I won't I won't comment too much about it. But rather, perhaps this is a topic for somebody else at another at another summit. But agreed. You know, agreed. as we move to that virtual world where there's no longer a physical manifestation, yep. uh, as as AI improves, will there be? And I'm sure there will be. Not non people. There will be AI driven people that you can interact with and and that will get good enough to the point that you won't you won't be able to tell yeah that that's not a real person right and so there are going to be a ton of very interesting ramifications coming from that that i think that we'll have to we'll have to deal with in the future and i'll say that i'm very excited for for what's coming and the work that our friends at the durham college ai hub are doing the students there uh, i think are, are going to be doing some very innovative things in the future and I look forward to seeing how they make the impossible possible in the future. I, I agree. Yeah, there's a there, there's a lot of interesting things happening, you know, at the academia level, and obviously, you know, the the Enable AI Hub is is just sort of doing a, a great job there. And I think just overall, if you look at other colleges, universities, but also organizations, I think there's a lot of effort put in place today to really help drive AI ML. And it, I think the next five to six years are going to be really interesting as we see the the emergence of AI in some very unique places and with with sort of the privacy elements built and baked into it. And I think with that, I know we're about a couple of minutes out. So I want to make sure that if there's any further questions or if anybody has questions, um, we'll, 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 we'll take, take some questions now. I think we did. We did kind of answer quite a few questions or a few questions yeah. throughout, throughout the talk. So I think maybe uh, we can leave on that parting thought then that you know, looking towards the future and, and seeing all the wonderful things that are going to be possible that, you know, in the past were too manually intensive. And certainly from a security perspective, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that AI and ML are going to make all of our online lives safer so that, you know, as, as I become the old guy online and scams are coming at me telling me that I'm going to be arrested and the RCMP has a warrant for my arrest because I haven't paid my taxes. Um, I'm hoping that the AI and ML will be smart enough to help filter those things out and protect me in, in my future life. So I agree. I agree. No, I, I totally agree with you there. Well, again, uh, we want to thank everybody for taking the time today to and giving us your hour to connect with us. And, uh, you know, thanks, everybody. Uh, enjoy the rest of the summit. Yeah. Thank you very much for, for having us here to speak today. Thank you. Bye now.